In this video specifically, we are going to talk about really the two main glands of the endocrine system, or at least the main kind of regulators of the endocrine system, which are the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands. In this lecture specifically, um, we'll talk about both the hypothalamus and the pituitary. The pituitary gland is divided into the anterior and, sorry, this should say posterior pituitary. And um, we'll talk about the major hormones and functions of those two distinctions of the pituitary gland as well. So the hypothalamus is actually an area of the brain um, so it's located kind of here at the bottom of the brain, circled in red. Um, and the hypothalamus is actually kind of part of one of the more ancient parts of our brain. And it's responsible for regulating body temperature, our sleep-wake cycles, and water balance. So things like when you feel thirsty, your hypothalamus is telling you to drink more water. If you're not thirsty, you don't need water. So it's, it's helping maintain kind of some of our basic functions. Um, and the hypothalamus is really important because if we were to zoom into that structure, we would see that it is physically connected to the pituitary. Um, the pituitary is just kind of this little like P-shaped organ. It's connected to the hypothalamus by a stalk and then um, kind of extends into these two lobes. Um, we're going to see that the pituitary is divided into the posterior and the anterior portions but, and that each kind of have a different function, but overall, notice that there are these um, kind of purple and green connecting neurons that physically dive into the pituitary from the hypothalamus. So this is how the hypothalamus really regulates what is going on in the pituitary gland. Um, and really, that hypothalamus, all it does is release hormones that then influence the pituitary. So the actual hormones that are released by the hypothalamus are specifically called neurosecretory cells, um, or they're, they're produced by these neurosecretory cells. And these are funky cells in that they are neurons, um, so they're the same type of cell that is in your brain that fires electrical impulses, However, rather than releasing an electrical impulse, they release hormones. And there are two hormones that can be released by the neurosecretory cells. And specifically, we're going to talk about the hormones that interact with the anterior pituitary first. So the anterior pituitary is here. It's on the right-hand side of this figure. Um, anterior means it's facing like frontwards. Um, it's the largest of the two lobes, and it is connected to the hypothalamus via the neurosecretory cells that are color-coded in purple in this diagram. Um, what's interesting is if you follow these neurosecretory cells, if we kind of follow their extension, notice that they are physically connected to capillaries. So they are connected to a blood supply. So the hypothalamus, it can release either what are called releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones from these purple neurosecretory cells. Those hormones will then be released into these capillaries and they will travel through those capillaries to the anterior pituitary. Um, there are many hormones that are released by the anterior pituitary, which we'll talk in a bit. In general, releasing hormones stimulate the anterior pituitary to release hormones. The inhibiting hormones inhibit. So um, if we want activity to increase, we can release those releasing hormones. If we want activity of the anterior pituitary to decrease, we can um, release inhibiting hormones hormones. But again, these, these, the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary via capillaries. So we have these neurosecretory cells releasing their hormones into our bloodstream 
and then they travel through that capillary bed into the anterior pituitary. We're gonna see that that's different when we get into the posterior pituitary. So again, the hypothalamus is also connected to the posterior lobe of the pituitary, but here um, the connection is shown by the green neurosecretory cells here in the hypothalamus. And if you follow their kind of pathway, you'll see that instead of releasing their hormones into a capillary bed, they actually make a direct connection to the posterior pituitary. So we have a direct connection here, and these neurosecretory cells, these green cells of the hypothalamus, release two different hormones. These are oxytocin, which is shortened to OT, or antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And what's interesting, so these green neurosecretory cells will release those hormones and they actually become stored by the posterior pituitary. So they are kind of just held there until the, that portion of the pituitary receives a signal that it needs to release those. So really, all of our hormonal control starts with the hypothalamus. So we have this regulatory center in the brain that's then going to talk to our pituitary gland. So without the hypothalamus, really none of the downstream regulation of our hormones would actually occur. So, but while the hypothalamus really controls everything else, it's truly the pituitary gland that is considered kind of the master gland of our endocrine system. So let's look at the pituitary gland. So again, um, we're going to see that the anterior and posterior divisions of the pituitary release a huge amount of hormones. Um, specifically, the posterior pituitary is going to release that antidiuretic hormone and that oxytocin that it's storing that were released from the hypothalamus. But the releasing hormones or the inhibiting hormones of the hypothalamus regulate the hormones that are then released by the anterior pituitary. And those hormones are listed here and are denoted by the, the purple arrows. So purple for anterior, green for posterior pituitary. And what I'd like to do is because these two lobes of this gland are so important, I'd like to look at these two portions individually. So let's start with the anterior pituitary gland. So the anterior pituitary gland, it has six hormones that it regulates. Um, again, as shown in these purple arrows here, those are growth hormone, prolactin, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. And these hormones, again, as mentioned in that crash course biology video, these are released into the bloodstream, and then they will travel to target organs that they then interact with. So notice that all six of these hormones are going to be released from the anterior pituitary. However, the organs that they act on are kind of spread throughout the body. So everything from our reproductive organs, like the ovaries and the testes, to our bones and muscles, to the mammary glands in females, to the adrenal gland, which is located on top of our kidney, to the thyroid gland, which is kind of right on our throat, like almost if you're a guy, it's right where your uh, Adam's apple is. So the anterior pituitary is really going to regulate a ton that has to do with our body. And these six hormones are really important so what I'd like to do is actually go through these hormones to kind of tell you what they do in the body. And um, I'll give you some examples of what happens when these hormones are not functioning properly. So the first hormone that is, uh, we're going to talk about from the anterior pituitary is growth hormone, or GH. As its name suggests, it increases the rate of growth in cells. Um, most of the targets really are kind of anywhere in the body. Um, targets include our bone cells, our muscle cells, 
cartilage, other tissues as well. Really almost every single cell in our body can be regulated or is a target of growth hormone. Um, and these figures here are just showing you some examples of when growth hormone doesn't or is either over or underproduced. Um, so if you have too much growth hormone, um, you can get gigantism. Um, so we see examples in Robert Wadlow um, here on the, he's the tallest person in that figure on the top right, and Andre the Giant. Um, Andre the Giant was a famous uh, WWE wrestler. He's pictured here with Kurt Cobain. Um, I picked this picture because A, I mean Nirvana is the best, right? But um, also I wanted to highlight that not only does growth hormone really influence the height of an individual, but it really makes all of your body huge. Like if you compare Kurt Cobain's hand to Andre the Giant's hand, I mean, his fingers could just like crush uh, Kurt Cobain's hand. Um, obviously it affects your height the most. I mean, Robert Wadlow was eight foot 11 inches. Andre the Giant was seven foot four inches. Um, you can also have an underproduction of growth hormone, and that can cause dwarfism. Um, Lavinia Warren, it, she's an old time actor. She was only 32 inches tall, and that was because her body underproduced growth hormone. So she was really tiny. Um, so growth hormone is really important, and we want kind of a, a normal amount to be expressed in our bodies to help regulate kind of having an average height. Too much or too little can drastically affect the growth of our, of our tissues and cells. Um, so prolactin is another one of the six hormones released by the anterior pituitary. And its main job is to stimulate the mammary glands to produce milk in females. Um, so this means that they are producing milk. This is not the hormone that allows them to release milk. So it's just getting the mammary glands ready to um, create milk. Um, this also has been shown prolactin to interfere with other female sex hormones, um, which sometimes explains why women who are breastfeeding have a paused menstrual cycle. Um, however, while prolactin may affect the menstrual cycle, um, breastfeeding should not be used as a method of birth control. It's not reliable enough, just kind of to keep that in mind. Um, males also produce prolactin. Not much is known in terms of how prolactin acts in male tissue, but it is thought that it might regulate the production of mature sperm. So there, during sperm formation in males, there is a time where the sperm is created, but it needs to go through kind of this final maturation process. And it's thought that prolactin might actually help with that. Next up is thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, as its name suggests, it stimulates the thyroid gland, which again, we're gonna talk about in the part two of this video, but it sits right directly kind of on our throat, right on our esophagus. Um, thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, is considered a tropic hormone. A tropic hormone is a hormone that's produced by one gland and it's designed to affect another gland. So again, the anterior pituitary releases TSH, which then acts on the thyroid. So we have one gland, the pituitary, releasing a hormone to act on another gland. So we have first gland, second gland, and then the thyroid gland will go on to release its hormones and do whatever it's supposed to do. So the, and the pituitary will see kind of in the next examples releases a lot of tropic hormones and it causes what we call a cascade of hormone kind of release in the body. And that was kind of mentioned at the end of that uh, crash course biology video as well. So tropic hormones really are responsible for starting cascade events that were discussed in that video. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, is also a tropic hormone that's released by the anterior pituitary, and it specifically acts on the adrenal gland. 
Um, the adrenal gland are these kind of pyramid looking structures that sit on top of our kidneys. Um, and note kind of your kidneys are up pretty high. So kind of where we think our lungs are located, um, it's actually where our kidneys are located and the adrenal glands sit right on top of that. And ACTH specifically controls the production um, and secretion of hormones from um, the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. Um, so we're gonna talk more about the adrenal gland in part two of these videos. Um, however, notice that the adrenal gland, if you kind of make a cross section cut through this, it has this outer layer that's yellow, that's the adrenal cortex, and then the inner section is called the adrenal medulla. And um, specifically, ACTH acts on the cortex of the adrenal glands. And follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, also produced by the anterior pituitary, is another example of a tropic hormone. Um, it specifically stimulates hormone production in the gonads, in both males and females. Um, follicle stimulating hormone gets its name for the action that it, work, that it does in the female reproductive system, but this also does play a role in um, the testes as well. In females specifically, FSH stimulates the ovaries to develop egg cells. Um, so this figure here on the left, we um, basically in the ovaries, and we'll talk about this when we get to reproduction, but in the ovaries, you have these little um, components called the follicles. These follicles are housed the egg um, that will eventually be released and um, will either be fertilized by a sperm to create offspring or um, will not be fertilized, which then triggers the beginning of a female's menstrual cycle. But basically what this figure shows is kind of from left to right, it shows the maturation process of the follicle that leads up to the release of an egg. And FSH is responsible for kind of starting that process. Um, it also stimulates, FSH does the ovaries to release estrogen. So the ovaries as a tissue also produce a hormone. And so FSH acts tropically to stimulate the ovaries to release estrogen. Um, in males, again, not a ton is known about how FSH specifically functions in males, um, but it has been shown to be responsible for promoting the maturation of sperm. So it is important in males as well. Um, and the maturation of sperm is kind of shown here where sperm start off as kind of what's called a primordial germ cell, and then they eventually become mature sperm that are released um, and can go on to fertilize an egg. And finally, luteinizing hormone, or LH, also produced by our anterior pituitary, um, is another tropic hormone. It also gets its name from its um, job in female in the female reproductive system, but is required for both males and females. Um, luteinizing hormone also stimulates the gonads, so it works on both the ovaries and testes. In females, it stimulates the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone. So again, these are two hormones. So we're acting tropically. We have one gland releasing a hormone to tell another tissue to release other hormones. And in females, luteinizing hormone stimulates the testes to secrete testosterone. So in, luteinizing hormone is actually promoting the release of hormones in both males and females that promote kind of secondary sex characteristics. Um, so the things you think of like that are different between males and females, luteinizing hormone kind of starts that process off. So again, the anterior pituitary here is very active. It's producing these six very critical hormones that are then going to work downstream to activate other hormones. Um, notice that really with the exception of growth hormone, which so growth hormone can be released and directly act on bones and muscles, um, and with also with the mammary glands, with the production of milk, 
notice that for most of the case, the anterior pituitary is releasing those tropic hormones, um, hormones that are going to act on other glands and stimulate the release of yet more hormones. So we're really starting this cascading event with the anterior pituitary. We still have the posterior pituitary, so let's quickly look at the two hormones that are regulated from this portion of this master gland. So remember that it's actually the hypothalamus that is going to create and release both antidiuretic hormone, ADH, or oxytocin, um, OT. But those hormones will be released and stored in the posterior pituitary. Eventually, that posterior pituitary will be stimulated to release those hormones into the bloodstream. And those hormones will move kind of through the body and interact with their targets. So let's look at what antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin actually do. So antidiuretic hormone, ADH, um, this actually stimulates our kidneys to conserve water. So think anti for we are not having something. Um, diuresis, uh, so di, I'm going to spell this wrong, I think. Diuresis is like the scientific term for urinating. So antidiuretic hormone just says that you are not urinating. Um, and so we are decreasing urine output when this uh, hormone is active in our body. Another term for antidiuretic hormone is called vasopressin. So if you ever hear that term, the, it's the same thing. It's talking about ADH. Um, kind of an example. So we've actually all experienced when ADH is not active or is being repressed in our body. Um, if you've ever drank in alcohol, you have, there's always that moment where you have to pee and you feel like you have to pee often. Um, and the, one of the big reasons why alcohol is so dehydrating to your body is because alcohol actually um, inhibits, sorry, alcohol, there we go, um, inhibits ADH. And so when you drink alcohol, your uh, hypothalamus no longer produces ADH it's not being, or it's not being released by the pituitary. And so your kidneys are just kind of filtering and creating urine like crazy. That's also another reason why when drinking your urine is pretty clear colored. Um, a lot of the symptoms that you have of like a hangover after um, drinking too much alcohol are simply due to dehydration. Um, essentially you've peed so much and your ADH has been not working um, that you've dehydrated a lot of your tissues, and that's kind of why you feel like crap the next day. Um, there also can be uh, other causes that cause um, ADH to be deficient, and one of those diseases is actually called diabetes insipidus. Um, this is not to be confused with diabetes mellitus. So diabetes insipidus is a deficiency in ADH, where essentially the body just experiences extreme fluid loss. Um, symptoms of diabetes insipidus include like in, uh, increased thirst, and someone is you know constantly thirsty. Um, they pee a lot, and that's because they have lowered amounts of ADH, which means their um, urine output is increased. We're going to talk about diabetes mellitus as well. That is kind of the diabetes we're more commonly aware of with like having um, decreased insulin and, and having our blood sugar be too high. So these are two different things. Diabetes insipidus has to do with your kidneys um, and has to do specifically with having a deficiency in ADH. And finally, um, oxytocin is the second hormone that is stored and then released by the posterior pituitary. And um, oxytocin or OT has a lot of different names, um, sometimes called the love hormone or the hug hormone. Um, oxytocin, you, all of us actually release oxytocin when we um, give people hugs, when we are feeling, if you like pet your cat and you like, or your pet and you have like this really kind of nice, happy, calm feeling because of that, that's actually because of oxytocin. 
Um, and so that, that's where it gets its name, the love hormone. Um, so if you're in a bad mood or you're having a rough day, give someone a hug um, or pet your pet your pet at home because you will release oxytocin and it will help you feel a little bit better. Um, but besides making us feel a little bit happier uh, day to day, oxytocin is really important um, during motherhood. Um, particularly, oxytocin actually is what starts contractions during childbirth. Um, so what's kind of interesting is that, so once a baby has reached term, um, it's gotten really big, right? And it's living in this itty bitty living space. And um, the baby is actually oriented in the uterus so that its head is pointing down. And um, the baby's head's actually then pushing on the opening of the uterus. That stretches the muscle of the uterus. And because our nerves in the uterine lining, the, there, because there is muscle here, there are nerves that go all the way up to the hypothalamus. And they tell the hypothalamus, hey, I'm being stretched. And that stimulates the hypothalamus to release oxytocin. So it says, oh, okay, I feel pressure. Let's release oxytocin. When that oxytocin is released, it actually increases uterine contractions. So it actually increases the amount of pressure that's being felt. That's going to then go back to the hypothalamus and say, hey, I'm getting more pressure the hypothalamus is going to release more oxytocin. So this is actually an example of positive feedback where we have something happening in the body, a stimulus, in this case pressure against the uterus, causing a continued and increased release of, in this case, a hormone. Eventually at birth, that pressure disappears. As soon as the baby has passed through the birth canal, there's no longer any pressure against the uterine lining, and so this entire process stops. Um, so remember, with positive feedback, there has to be something that completely, like, basically cuts off the signal. In this case, the cutting off of the signal is the childbirth. So really important during birth. Um, after birth, um, post, postpartum, um, oxytocin is also important for actually stimulating milk ejection from the mammary glands. So remember, prolactin produced by the anterior pituitary stimulates the production of milk, but it's oxytocin from the posterior pituitary that actually stimulates milk to be released from the mammary glands. So you need two hormones working in that tissue in order to both produce milk and release milk. Oxytocin also is present in males. Again, not fully understood what it does in males, um, but it is thought that it might help facilitate the transport of sperm to the reproductive tract. Um, so it, it does play a role. We just don't know a whole lot about what it does yet in males. All right, so that is the kind of master regulatory center of the endocrine system. Again, we have the hypothalamus, which really is working on the anterior pituitary and that um, and the posterior, and that pituitary gland as a whole is going to release a set of hormones that really go on to regulate every other gland that's part of the endocrine system.